the start of time. No? Already, it lays. Yes, yes. Okay. Today, we are very happy to have a Professor Dan Free. And he will talk about, he will talk about the uh, anomaly evolving time reversal symmetry for M theory. And let's welcome Dan. <laughs> and also, uh, the talk starts from now to 12. And after 12, we will have a, a lunch gathering at the small seminar room in 302, the small one. Okay. And please stay and uh, have more discussion. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I was taught by my elders that an hour and a half is much too long for a seminar. <laughs> so uh, let's see if I actually feel all the time. What I want to talk about is uh, joint work with Mike Hopkins. So the, the talk is an application of uh, topology, geometry, to a problem in string theory, particularly in M theory. And so I'll spend some time kind of motivating the math we do and then explain a little bit about the mathematics we do. So M theory is a flavor of string theory that was introduced in the mid-90s. Everybody knows that by Whitten. As far as I know, there's no kind of fundamental formulation of M theory. And so we'll study it in a low energy field theory approximation, which is 11 dimensional supergravity, so an 11 dimensional relativistic field theory. And, uh, but it has one crucial kind of gravitation correction. So it's not the original 11 dimensional supergravity, which was constructed by Julia Kramer's Shirk in some order in 1978. But this has an additional term that uh, we'll talk about. So the time reversal invariance is the issue, and let me just explain in relativistic field theory what that means. So relativistic field theory, if we're in n space-time dimensions, starts in Minkowski space-time. And at every point, this is an affine space, at every point you have a light cone, you have a translation invariant Lorentz metric. And, um, the vector symmetries, once we run out by translations, is the orthogonal group of 1 and minus 1. And that group has four components. In fact, the group of components is the client group C2 plus C2. And they're distinguished by asking whether the symmetry preserves or reverses orientation, and asking whether it preserves or reverses the um, white like vectors the time-like vectors in them. <coughs> now when you quick rotate, it's an Euclidean field theory. <coughs> then you're on Euclidean space. And Euclidean space, the Euclidean group, its components are just C12. So in a relativistic field theory, you have a group of symmetries that always includes the identity component maps onto the identity component. And therefore, when you rotate, it maps onto the identity component here. But there's a question of whether uh, it maps onto the other component or not. And over here, that's the question of whether, well, here there are four components. But that's a little bit misleading, because in fact, one of the pieces of structure in a relativistic field theory is an orientation of that light cone. Because you need to know that time -like. you need to know what positive time like is, or duly what positive energy is. And so the group of symmetries that preserves that is actually a cyclic of order two. And the non-identity component is really given by a reflection symmetry in space. And so sometimes that's called parity, although the word parity I think was used for when you in space reverse the just reflect about the origin transformation minus one. And if the space dimension is even, which it is in our problem because we have 10 plus 1 dimensions, then that doesn't reverse orientation. So that's an identity component. So anyway, it should be a reflection symmetry. And the question of whether that reflection symmetry is there is the same as whether the reflection symmetry is here. So the question of having that symmetry is the question of whether we have the full Euclidean group 
in the Euclidean field theory. And then the CPT theorem is the one that tells you you get the time reversal in addition. But that comes as a symmetry in the sense that it's anti -linear. So it's a different kind of symmetry. Anyway, the final step is the usual step in Riemannian geometry is to study the theory on a Riemannian manifold. And if we have the full Euclidean symmetry, in the sense the symmetry group here becomes a kind of structured group here. We don't have the global symmetries, but we have the structure of the manifold. And if we have this parity symmetry or time reversal symmetry, by the time we get over here, that tells us that we should have the theory on unoriented manifolds. So the question really in the talk, then, is to study this field theory on um, closed, in our case, 11 manifolds and to ask whether we can consistently formulate it on unoriented manifolds. So that's the basic question in the talk. All right. So why is it expected that M theory should have the symmetry? Well, even at the beginning, that symmetry was used by Witten and Morava and others. For example, to take the 11-dimensional theory and study it on a 10-dimensional manifold, like Minkowski space-time, cross uh, a circle mod out by reflection. That reflection symmetry, of course, re um, reverses uh, the orientation. And so for that to be well-defined, you need to have M theory have that symmetry. So that's expected, and that then propagates to all sorts of other dualities and so on. So M theory better have that symmetry, or um, a lot would go wrong. So, yeah, so Witten wrote a paper. Well, so there are lots of studies of M theory from the mid-90s, as I'll say. But the question of doing it on non-orientable manifolds wasn't much considered. But because this time reversal symmetry and therefore unorientable manifolds has come back in condensed matter physics and related topology, um, that question emerged again. And Witten wrote a paper checking this kind of invariance for the M2 brain, which is a three-dimensional problem, and posed the question for the full 11-dimensional problem. And so that's the one we're going to address. All right, so what are the, so this M theory has fields, three fields, which are G, which is the Riemannian metric, Psi, which is called the Rita Schwinger field, and C, which is it's locally a uh, three form. And uh, so, what is this psi? This psi is a section of, we're going to study it on manifold <coughs> one, of, let's say, S tensor Tx, where this S is a spin bundle. And so, in order to formulate that, we need some sort of spin structure. <coughs> but remember that we're on an unoriented manifold, and so that's what we might call the version of spin for unoriented manifolds, which is pin. <coughs> and um, there are two kinds of pin, and that corresponds, by the time we get back to Minkowski space time, to two kinds of groups that cover uh, this group, this non identity component. And uh, they differ by asking whether if you take a time reversal that just, say, is a reflection, so on the points of space-time, it squares to the identity. But when you lift the spin bundle, we act on the Hilbert space, you can ask whether it squares to the identity, say, on the states of the Hilbert space, or whether it acts as the grading operator, usually called minus 1 to the f. And the physically relevant one is the one that the latter. And by the time you wick rotate, we need a um, plus structure on our manifold X. So that could be considered as a field. That's a discrete version of the field. It satisfies the sheaf-like properties, the locality that you expect of the field. So in M theory, we have this pin structure, which allows us to define psi, and then we have these other fields. Yeah? So we get spin plus instead of pin minus because we want psi to be real? Or well, there are different ways you might think about it. I think the most fundamental is to ask about what happens to the symmetries here in space-time. And is 
the particular group, the algebra of time reversal that leads under Wick rotation plus rather than yeah. one, one comment maybe you can make about that is that um, you want M theory to have supersymmetry, and so you need a minor on a spinner representation. So you need the, the spinner to be real for pin plus. Yes. I mean, if it were pin minus, that's right. I mean, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do that. OK. Right. So um, So just one remark, that this pin plus structure is a tangential structure. It's a structure on the tangent bundle. Eventually, we're going to use ideas in stable homotopy theory where it's more natural to think about the stable normal bundle. And in that context, it's usually called pin minus because the structure on the stable normal bundle happens to be pin minus, not pin plus. But here, we want the tangential structure, which is pin plus. So let me focus a little bit first on this C field. So can I ask, yeah. t, t squared is 2 minus 1 to the f. Yeah. Okay. So let's focus on the C field. Now, I haven't written down the action of supergravity, and I won't, but the supergravity action includes a term, which is the integral, it's a constant, times the integral of C wedge to C. So this is cubic in the C field. And now we have to make sense of that term on x, which is a manifold without an orientation. Well, if C is globally a 3-form, um, this is an 11-form, but we need an orientation to integrate a differential form. So that doesn't work. So the solution is to have C be a form that's twisted. So C is a 3-form on x but it's twisted by the orientation level. So any smooth manifold has an orientation double cover, which is canonically oriented, and associated to that as a line bundle. And so we can look at this differential form twisted by that, which is just to say it's a three-form on the orientation double cover, which under the Beck transformation changes sign. And if I wedge it with itself three times under the Beck transformation, it still changes sign. And so that's really a density, and that's what you can integrate on the manifold. So we immediately learn that C has to be uh, this twisted three form. But uh, there's more. But we need to also impose Dirac uh, charge quantization. So the rocks argument is for the electromagnetic field in four dimensions, but it applies to any really engaged field, and this is an example of such. And so we need some integrality to say what uh, C is. So let me tell you that by telling you an analogy, which is to have a spin C structure on a manifold, say, M. So a spin C structure we can think is locally a one form. And that's true. But what is it globally? Well, globally, we have a pair, C, which is a cohomology class in degree two with integer coefficients. And we have F which is just a two-form on M that happens to be closed. And it satisfies the condition that C, if I reduce mod 2 to mod 2 cohomology, I get W2 at the manifold, meaning the second schieffel whitney class. And that F, which is a closed form, so it has a Durand cohomology class. And the Durand cohomology class is exactly C. So that's an equation in uh, the second cohomology with real coefficients. So that's what a spin C, not just structure, but really connection. You might think of the structure as being the C, but then there's the local data, which is the connection. 
And of course, this form F is locally DA, but the A doesn't exist globally. So that's so a spin C structure is more than uh, just this pair. So a spin C structure gives you this pair, but there's more data that's tying the F and the C together, telling you how these equations are implemented. And even not just for the spin C connection, but just for a spin C structure, there's a little more data, not just an equality, a condition that C be equal to W2 mod 2, but there's a little bit of data in saying that C is actually an integral lift of W2. So the C field, as a similar structure. And we might think of that as kind of MC connection. Um, because it pertains to M theory. So this is something that Witten uh, discovered in the mid 90s. And so how does it look? Well, again, locally, it's a three form, as we've said. But now it's a twisted three form. It takes values in this twisted form. And so globally, we have a class C, which is in H4 of M, with coefficients in Z, but the Z has to be twisted now, twisted by the orientation double cover. So that's the integrality. That's like the quantization of charge. But then we still have the local field. It's usually called G in this case. And this is then a global four form, again, twisted it's closed, and it satisfies analogous equations that C is congruent to W4 or 2, and that the Durham class G is obvious. And again, it's more than this. But those are the conditions. So I should have said here that spin C structures don't always exist. The simplest example is to take the complex projective plane, CP2. CP2 has um, W2 is the non-trivial class in degree 2. It has an integer lift, which is this dual to a CP1, a line sitting in the plane. But CP2 has a symmetry, which is um, complex conjugation. And so you can build a 5-manifold, which is its mapping torus. So as you go around, the fibers over a circle, as you go around the circle, the fiber complex conjugates. And that preserves the mod 2 class, that complex conjugation, but it changes the sign of the integer class. So that integer class disappears. So you still have a non-trivial W2, but no integer lift. So that's the lowest dimensional and simplest example of a manifold that doesn't admit one of these uh, spin C structures. The same is true for these MC structures. So again, the MC structure is the thing I get by eliminating the contractible data of the differential form. That's the local data of the C field, the current and so on, but just remembering in a sense the charge, which is the integral data. So if I take the manifold RP4, for example, then RP4 does have such a structure. So W4 is non-trivial, but there is a class in H4 here, whose one to reduction is W4, so yes. But RP12 uh, does not. So that's an example. And we'll be interested in 12 manifolds, one more than 11. That's an example that doesn't. On the other hand, if I have any M spin manifold, so a spin manifold we can make into a pin plus manifold. And then, yeah, so pin, any spin manifold does. And there's, in fact, a canonical choice, which is a characteristic class of C, which is a characteristic class lambda. And this class lambda satisfies that twice lambda is the first Montreal class, that lambda reduces mod 2 to W4. So I should have said, we want this notion on uh, the manifold M, which is already N plus. We could, of course, ask for this lift of W4, twisted lift, without saying it's N plus. But we want both. So having N plus and having uh, this twisted integral lift, 
that's exactly the topological data we need to define this. So the pin plus lets us define psi, any manifold with its Riemannian metrics, that's no problem. And to have C exist globally, we need that structure. So those are the manifolds that M theory is formulated. Is there any sense in which this is, do you believe this is like the, the full bulk structure? I mean, full what? The full, the full structure in M theory when the manifold is smooth, um, full topological structure. I know that there's also, this, this M, MC structure is equivalent to matching of the class W tilde 5 that Wynn calls. There's also W tilde 7. Do you think there's some restriction there? Or is this everything that there should be? Well, um, Certainly for this talk, this is sure. everything there should be. I don't, uh, yeah. okay, I don't recall what topological sure. considerations would lead to another condition. Sure. I can just say that by following your nose from the supergravity, sure. you can count with that. Okay, so, um, so what we want to do now is discuss this term, first of all this term plus the gravitational correction, we'll see, and uh, understand that, and already understand before we start integrating the integral over any of these fields, we already have a trouble, mod 2 minor trouble, so I want to explain that, and an anomaly, and that then has to be canceled by something, and that's not canceled in the classical theory, but if I integrate over psi, which is, appears quadratically, so that's what to do. That also has an anomaly. And the story is to understand that those two anomalies cancel. So that's where we're going. So let's understand this uh, C. Well, to understand C, we have to understand something about this uh, cubic form. And I'm going to give a little digression, an algebraic digression, into an algebraic theory of cubic forms into which this fits. So it's not just this term in the classical supergravity, but that plus a linear term in C, which is the quantum correction. And um, right, so I should say plus a term, which is another constant, times the integral of x of C times some gate form. And so this is the term that was, um, well, it was computed in type 2a string theory by Hoff and Witten. And then there's a paper of uh, Duff, Dew, and Manasian that said what form it has to take in M theory to be consistent with all the relationships. And this A form is, uh, is some function of the Montreal forms that you get from term A theory using the Riemannian metric. So there's some particular A form that appears. And so this, as I say, is not part of the supergravity but this gravitational correction. And so it's this inhomogeneous cubic form that we want to look at. All right, so again, I want to look at a uh, spin C manifold. And for motivation, and here I'm going to look at the index point one, the index of the Dirac operator on the M in four dimensions. The index of the Dirac operator in six dimensions. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Dan. How, how direct is it to see the relation between the topological structure you found here and the topological structure in heterotic, which I think is being a straight manifold using the Verge Alphabet and type 1 heterotic duality? Sorry, the structure of the. So, uh, well, I, I think heterotic E8 turns E8 needs a string manifold. Like, that's what you find if you do the analogous. Dialogue for the heterotic B field. He's a twisted string structure. Okay. Twisted. Yeah. Oh, if, you, if that's, that's if you're unoriented or something. No, even on an oriented manifold, you don't need. So, for example, heterotic string makes sense on K3, which is not a string manifold, but it is a twisted string manifold twisted by the E8 gauge bundle. Okay. Um, and just since we have a duality between M theory and heterotic using that trick that you mentioned, putting on an S1 mod Z2, 
there should be some way to see that when I compactify an S1 mod Z2, this structure that you told me about turns into a twisted string. And I'm just curious how direct that is, or if that's like an actual something to answer your possible device. Long ago, thought about that one. I have thought long ago about the sum anomaly in the heterotic string and found it was related to this cubic form of the theory I'm about to tell you, in fact. I see. Related through one of these compactifications. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, the, you have a class in four-dimensional cohomology by G, right? And in heterotic string, you have a class of four-dimensional cohomology because B8 looks like KZ4, um, right? So there's a, there's a class in, in dimension four, which is the one that twists the string structure in heterotic, and I think that they're probably the same, although I haven't checked the details. Through the duality. Through the duality. I think that's true. I mean, and that's how Witten proved that the consistency that we're showing in the unoriented case, how he showed it in the case when you're oriented. So he used exactly that. To, the fact that this is roughly a map into a KZ4, it's just it's, it's a bundle of KZ4s, and the classifying space of E8 can take the 15 skeleton that just has one homotopy group. So he used that coincidence to something very clever there, so I think it's exactly right. Okay. Right, so this index is a function of C, this characteristic class, the spin C structure. And here the formula is you take C squared minus the signature. And then divide by 8, evaluate the fundamental class. And here the formula is you take C cubed minus P1 of M, the first Pontryagin class, times C, divide by 48. So this is an inhomogeneous quadratic form of C, this characteristic class, and this is an inhomogeneous cubic form of C, that characteristic class. The same degree two characteristic class. And so these are kind of models for building an algebraic theory of forms. So the classical thing, certainly not made from this model, is to build a theory of quadratic forms. So how does that go? Well, let L be a finitely generated free abelian group. So that means it's z to the r for some r, just the lattice. And let's suppose that we have uh, Bilinear bihomomorphism like this, which is symmetric and non degenerate, sometimes called unimodular. So that's the starting data. And if you have that, then the non degeneracy implies that there's a unique class C, C bar, which is an L reduced mod 2 such that if I take the square of any class, you see that's a linear operation in mod 2. And so, just by duality, that has to, by non-degeneracy, we have to have that for all x and all. Okay. So the non-degeneracy gives us that class. And then um, we can check that if I take the interval, oh, now we define what a characteristic element is in this context. So the definition is that the characteristic elements are the elements C in the lattice, just such that C is congruent to C bar mod 2. So just all the integral lifts of that special class C bar. So if you have a closed, um, if you have a closed four manifold, you can take this lattice to be its second cohomology with integer coefficients modulo torsion, and this pairing is just the cup product evaluated against the fundamental class, and then this C bar is the second Schieffelian class as long as the manifold's oriented, and so these characteristic elements are exactly the C's that occur in a spin C structure. And then, 
comma, subtract, that if I take C and a product C, mod A, this is independent of the choice C. And so that means that if you choose the right integer, that kappa C, which you define to be C, C minus sigma over A, we can make that an integer just by choosing sigma to be the right numbers. And, well, there's a particular choice which is picked out here, which is the signature of this bilinear form if I tensor up over the rationals. That this thing has a signature, and uh, that signature works. So that's the very classical theory of quadratic forms. And so what happens in the qubit case? Well, in the qubit case, we have L as before. And now we have a trilinear form. Again, symmetric. But now, what does non-degenerate mean? I don't know a good notion of non-degenerate in this case, I'm afraid. So, as a substitute, we have to postulate as part of the data a class C bar, which is an L times C, such that it satisfies our addition of the many two classes. This should be the same mod 2 as uh, x bar 1. So that's now the starting data. Again, you define the characteristic elements as before, the elements in L that lift the C bar. Now there's a similar little algebraic theory. So we let L star be the dual on from L into Z sense of the lattice, and um, it's not a dilemma, is that there exists a unique class, P, in the old rule, tensor Z1 24, such that it satisfies one equation. Qubit expressions mean we evaluate using this uh, trilinear form. And, um, okay, so that's the funny equation you get. But you can get it, you see, because um, you can motivate it, as I said, by modeling on the index of the rock operator. And um, the second thing is that if P is now a lift, lattice of this mod 24 class, then if I take this expression c cubed minus p dot c over 48, and I take it mod z, then this is independent of c, and it lies in a half z mod z, which is to say that it's either 0 or a half. So the integrality you get here is dividing by 24, but the nice cubic form is the bit divided by 48. So there's another statement, which is you can choose lifts p, which make this uh, an integer. You can choose lifts p to do that. But in our example, we won't have that lift necessarily. So how does this apply to the situation of just erasing? which are these MC structures. So our application is to take W now to be a closed uh, MC manifold, which 
means that we have one of these integral lips, of twisted integral lips of W4, as well as a pin plus structure. And it's 12 dimensional. That's one more than 11, but we'll see why the 11. And so what's our data? Well, L is the fourth homology with twisted coefficients modulo torsion. So that's our lattice. This cubic form. Uh, x, y, z is simply the cup product. And again, the triple cup product has twisted coefficients, so it makes sense to evaluate on the fundamental class, twisted fundamental class. And then uh, this mod 2 class is W4, fourth sheaf of the class. So already there's a lemma here calculation, scheme run squares, to say that the C bar satisfies this. To say that that satisfies them. And now the other part of the lemma is to say, finally in the M theory, what is this gravitational correction? So I told you there was an eight form that was computed from string theory. That eight form has some integrality, and it's the following. Again, doing it in this unoriented case. So there exists a unique characteristic class in degree A, which is characteristic class of pin plus bundles manifold, but modulo torsion, um, such that P is congruent to W8, which is a class there on two, and twice P is P2 minus lambda squared where lambda is that characteristic class of spin bundles. So this is an equation when I restrict back to H8 of B spin. So notice the L dual in this case is a degree eight cohomology, but with untwisted coefficients. Okay. And this particular expression is the one that comes from I mean, the reason we choose that particular P is because of that string theory calculation that gives this gravitational correction. Okay. So now we can define. Well, so then. This expression, c cubed minus this class P for our manifold W mod 48. If I take it mod Z, then this expression is, uh, well, first of all, it lies in a half C mod Z, so it's in a cyclic group of order two. Secondly, it's um, independent of C our characteristic vector. Um, that's the thing coming from the MC structure, so it actually doesn't depend on it. And it's also a bordism invariant. So if our 12 manifold bounds a 13 manifold with that structure, then just the analog of Stokes theorem tells you that it's bad. So it's a bordism. When you said it's independent of C, but it does depend on the MC structure, it depends on that extra data in addition to the lift? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. So it's not invariant of pin plus manifolds, is what I'm saying. Well, you see, <clears throat> that's a subtle point. Because I've said that this is W4, but when I tensor this L with Z mod 2, it's not the mod 2 cohomology. It's something funny. Yeah. And to see that I can take W4 and get an element of that group, I need to know there exists a twisted integer lift. Because right. obviously, if there's a twisted integer lift, and I tensor with Z mod 2, I get something right. in the L tensor Z mod 2. So that's where it's used. But the actual choice is not used. Its existence is used. So it makes sense on, on yeah, with, well, we're using pin plus to make this particular choice. So if you like, it makes sense on pin plus manifolds where, as you 
just that just the box type and nobody can manage the condition of the day. Okay. Right. So so here we have one of our invariants we'll call alpha at C. It's an invariant of this bordism group. And we'll use this notation for the bordism group. And it maps to plus minus one. And C star. So this notation is for a tone spectrum. And this bordism group, that goes back to the thesis of tone, that if you can express it in homotopy theory. And anyway, if you have a manifold W that represents an element of the bordism group, it's just x pi i, this thing, c cubed minus c OK. Now, why is that the relevant uh, quantity for the, the m theory? Well, for the m theory, I have to tell you what this term is that's built out of the cubic form, the homogeneous part from supergravity, the inhomogeneous correction. And that term doesn't make sense in classical action S, it only makes sense in the exponentiated e to the i s. And in the exponentiated action, it's simply the secondary invariant that's associated to this invariant of 12 manifolds. So when you have an integer invariant of a 12 manifold like that, you often get a secondary invariant one dimension down. For example, Chern Simons invariants is secondary invariants for von Schiagen number. But here, we don't have an integer invariant, this quantity. It's a half integer invariant. And so being a half integer invariant, I don't really get a secondary invariant. I only get the square of that secondary invariant that I want. And so the fact that I only get the square means to define this one, it won't make sense as a complex number, but it'll live in a complex line. And that line definitely has order two. So if we have x11, with this MC, well, it needs the connection. In other words, it needs the local data C, not just the local topological data. Then um, when you have that, then uh, you can define the secondary invariant. Exponentiated, and it lives in some line. And furthermore, that line, and I square it, comes with a nice amorphism to the trivial line. So it's a line of order two. And so that's the signal that we have this anomaly. And so, as I said, that term in the classical action, the exponentiated classical action, is already an anomaly. It's an anomaly of order two. And how do we think about anomalies? Well, I want to think that this line is actually itself the state space of a quantum field theory, but that quantum field theory now is 12 dimensional. So this is attached to 11 manifold fields, fields. And now we have a 12 dimensional theory where this is the state space, it's one dimensional, so that means we have an invertible theory. So the anomaly alpha C is an invertible 12 dimensional theory. And it has order two, because the square is trivial. So it's necessarily a topological. So the M theory itself, this 11-dimensional theory, of course, is not topological. But this anomaly is uh, topological. It just has order two. And the M theory doesn't tell us what the partition function of this 12-dimensional theory is. But it has one. And it's given by that expression exactly. And that partition function is a bordism invariant. It's a bordism invariant. Yeah. And so that's how um, we understand anomalies. And this one is easy to compute. I mean, if you give me an actual MC manifold, if you notice what's an integer lift, it's a cohomology calculation to compute it. So there's no, no big issues about that. So, excuse me. So this anomaly is invertible, multiple class anomaly. Well, I mean, this whole field theory has order two, right. meaning that if I square this field theory, then I get trivial theory. And I wonder, is there a possibility to have other non-invertible anomalies you need to check, other than this context, maybe something else? 
Well, I think like, generally when you have a quantum field theory, if it's absolute, it makes sense. It's like absolute, there's that's nothing right. else to say. Right. If it's anomalous, then it's defined relative to one higher dimensional theory. Right. Could be truncated. But to talk about that quantum field theory, I already have to know the higher theory. Right. You see, it's like saying if I have a vector, if I have a number, 3.7, I can talk about that number. If that's an element of a one-dimensional vector space, I can't tell you that element until I know the vector space. So I can't tell you what the quantum field theory is until I know the anomaly. So you're asking, is it possible there's another anomaly? Well, it's One possible, but then there's another field theory. See, for this field theory, the only way I know how to define it is to tell you first what the anomaly theory is, and then tell you what the theory is. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you detect this 12-dimensional uh, coarse invariant on a mapping torus? Ah. Um, I don't think so, but ask me again when we get to the computational. Oh, okay, the great. Yeah. But again, the um, that's a longer discussion about why that question might not matter for the physically relevant conclusions. But let me, anyway, any more questions before I turn to the Ruby Dishwinger? Okay. So remember that we have the, uh, well, we have these fields, the thin plus structure, the metric, psi, c. And already in this classical theory, which is invertible, we already have an anomaly, this mod two anomaly for the c field. Now we're going to integrate outside, and we'll get a theory whose background fields are these three. Oh, oops. Yeah. And um, we're going to get, in this theory, well, the same anomaly will persist. It's still there. We still have that cubic form. But now we're going to get a new anomaly from integrating outside. And the theorem, of course, is that the two of them cancel. So here we have a well-defined theory. That's what we show. Now, how do we integrate out over psi? Well, that's the old story about anomalies. And so um, you know, the usual story is you have the fermionic path integral that has the form that you're integrating in Euclidean space, this kind of thing, where D is some skew form. Some skew form. And so the answer is that this is the Fafian of that form B. But again, that Fafian doesn't make sense as a number. It lives in some fine complex line, which is the Fafian line. And here we have a whole family of those depending on these other fields. So we get a line bundle over that family, and we want to study that line bundle. That's the anomaly. So we have to do this on pin plus manifolds. And there's uh, not much literature, actually, in the geometry literature about rock operators about unorientable manifolds, just everybody's taste. Um, there is some guilty and so on. And anyway, uh, one of the things we found is a uniform way to understand the rock operators on pin manifolds. Let me just tell you that quickly. And it just comes from taking the pin group in, say, dimension n. We're interested in dimensions 11 and 12. And saying that that group embeds in a spin group in the same pin minus. And here it embeds in the Lorentz spin group. Here it embeds in the compact spin group. And uh, the spin group you should think of as sitting inside the Clifford algebra. And this sits inside the Clifford algebra. Minus n plus 1. So the notation means the first number is how many generators squared plus 1. The second one is how many generators squared minus 1. 
in that Clifford algebra. And the map is simply taking the gamma, the gamma, and plus one, where that's the last generator squared, plus one here. So what this tells you you can do is, if you have a n-dimensional n-manifold of one of these types, then, um, well, you can use this embedding to construct a vector bundle, which is constructed from the action of this pin group on this vector space, just acting by left multiplication. And so you get some bundle, some S over here. And um, that bundle still has a right action, by these Clifford algebras. And so it has a left action by the opposite Clifford algebra, which is, uh, so I screwed that up. That should have been added one. That should have been one. And so the opposite Clifford algebra is, well, in our case, it's one, this one. And so the Dirac operator we construct here has uh, is acting on a space with the action, with action. And what that means is it represents an element of KO theory in the appropriate degree that tells you this. So what it implies is that you get an index, KO in this case, uh, minus n minus 1. And in this case, you get an index, KO. So what it tells you is that the pin plus theory, index theory, on an n-dimensional manifold should look like exactly the usual spin index theory on a manifold of one dimension less, and the pin minus index theory looks like the index theory on a manifold of one dimension more. So that's a kind of useful rule of thumb in thinking about these unoriented spin manifolds. And uh, that holds for the topological index, but also for the geometric this is like Fafi and Lund bundles, eight invariants, and so on, which have an interpretation in the differential version of these groups. Now, there's one important difference when we come to the geometric theory. So, the geometric theory has variation formulas. So, here we would get the Fafi and Lund bundle in a family, we would get a curvature. If we have eight invariants, we get the derivative of the eight invariant. Those formulas are given as before, but now the dimension, because of the shift, we're integrating some form that, in the usual spin case, could give us something in various dimensions, but in the spin case, always gives zero, because of this dimension shift and the fact that those forms always had even degree. So, um, so what we get, even in the geometric case, like eight invariants in these Poffians, we get topological invariants. We don't get geometric. So in other words, the associated anomalies in this physics context will always be topological. They won't be um, geometric. So that principle applies here. And uh, so in our case, again, this Poffy and Lime bundle attached to our 11-dimensional manifold, and then we do it in families with these background fields, we want to interpret that as the state space of a 12-dimensional theory. And there's nothing in the 11-dimensional theory that tells us what the partition function of that 12-dimensional theory should be. We could go lower down and talk about factorizing this if I chop an 11-manifold. And uh, But there is an answer. This anomaly does have a 12-dimensional partition function, and it's the exponential of an 8 invariant. So one reason you know that that's the right answer, it's a theorem I proved with Dai a long time ago, which tells you that when you have a 12, in this case, a 12 manifold with boundary, that the exponentiated eight invariant lives in this top one. So that's good because then we can have a 12 dimensional anomaly theory and a partition function that goes along with the one for the C field. So that's one way in which this differs from the usual story that we're on pin manifolds rather than spin. The other one is that we have Burita Schwinger rather than an ordinary spinner field. And so we have to take into account exactly how to compute that anomaly. Um, that's certainly a known story. 
And so the bottom line is that if we have a 12 manifold, which is now pin plus, it's not going to be used anything about the C field, so we're not going to use that MC structure, then the invariant we're interested in is the exponential to pi i times the eight invariant of the Dirac operator, but coupled to the tangent bundle. Well, that's because this Verita Schwinger field is a section of spin bundle times the tangent bundle. But then we get these kind of spurious ordinary spinner fields, and you have to count them carefully, but you end up needing to subtract two of them in the correct normalization. And so that's the partition function of this theory. And this alpha f is, again, a bordism invariant. So again, the variation formula for the eight invariant is now an integral over a 13 manifold of the form, which has only long zero parts and degrees divisible by four. So anyway, that's zero. So this is a topological invariant. And it's also a bordism invariant. And so it's, uh, it's an invariant of pin plus manifolds. But again, it's tangential pin plus manifolds. The notation is that. And the invariant maps to C star. But in fact, this group is a finite group. So it maps to just roots of unity in here. And this group is isomorphic to Z mod 2 to the A plus Z mod 2 to the 4 plus Z mod 2 squared, in fact. And it's relevant to us that these are all powers of 2. And so this maps to roots of unity, which are all R2. OK, so that's a calculation of Kirby and Taylor. So for example, if I take this, um, well, so our particular invariant is this one. But just as an example, if I did the ordinary Dirac operator, oh, this combination that's relevant for Rita Schwinger, if I take x, let's say, 2 pi i, the eight invariant for r p 12 divide that by 4, then this is equal to well, plus or minus um, x of 2 pi i over 2 to the a plus or minus 1. So there are two pin structures, pin plus structures on RP12, and they lead to opposite elements of this bordism group. They represent a generator here, and the eight invariant detects that generator. In fact, these eight invariants typically detect the bordism classes, at least some dimensions, are part of the, sorry, it detects part of the bordism theory, these eight invariants. That's some pretty dopey stuff. All right. So, um, so now we see that we have two sources of anomalies. One is this uh, C field already, and one is the Rita Schwinger field after we integrate it out. And the idea is to show they cancel. And that's really showing that the product of those two invertible field theories is trivializable. But we're going to do that by just examining the partition function, using implicitly that the invertible field theory is determined by its partition functions. So that statement depends, in a sense, on how you define the invertible field theory and where it takes values. But um, we're going to use that. And so the theorem. is that if I take alpha Rita Schwinger times alpha C, well, this is a map on the bordism theory. This is identically one. <coughs> so that's the cancellation. Now, I should say that Witten proved the version of this where we don't do it for unoriented manifolds, but we do it for oriented manifolds. I mentioned that in relation to Jake's question that that's, uh, he gave a conceptual argument using a 
trick, in a sense, with E8 bundles to represent the C field. We couldn't find any such trick in this unoriented case, so we gave what's very much a plumber's proof. Anyway, we calculate. No offense to plumbers. No offense to plumbers. <laughs> I have that line in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't read the notes without my glasses. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So we we don't even calculate this group unless we calculate generators for that group. It's a finitely generated abelian group. We calculate some generators, and as long as we verify that product is one of those generators, then we're good. So that's the proof, the structure of the proof. It's not a very enlightening proof, but it's a proof nonetheless. So I've already told you that this calculation is pretty easy. Once you have the manifold in front of you, I'm going to illustrate just quickly uh, the most complicated example of calculating this one, which is essentially calculating these eight invariants. But, but the most important computation is the computation of these generators, and I'll show you how that looks, but that was the main brunt of the work. Was, of course, the world's expert. And uh, so a lot of time staring at different charts and then finding manifolds that really represent that, those generators. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm curious because this is very analogous to what you do when you talk about like churn time is level a half and you talk about a, a, a single fermion coupled to a spin C field. Um, and there, there's a, a good physics explanation of what the spin C field means. It means that you have charge spin relation, right? You have that fermions are even odd charge and bosons are even charge. Is there any sort of charge spin relation for, for what well, you're for asking MC a question, structure? Yeah, so you're asking a question back to Whitman's paper. Why is this the correct Dirac charge quantization mm -hmm. condition? I mean, I'll just say in general that when you have an abelian gauge field, for example, a Ramon Ramon field type two string theory, and you want to figure out what it is, then there are lots of inputs. So in that case, Yes, the spin charge relation tells you how the that those groups are in the product, but you get the U1 and the orthogonal group X, and you get spin C. In the case of Ramon Ramon, there are lots of inputs. You might know what some charged objects are in your quantum theory, in that case, certain brains in the string theory. You might have anomalies that motivate that, and that only can't, you know, that guide what the direct quantization condition is, which is essentially a choice of cohomology theory, where you know the theory rationally because you know the differential forms, but you need to understand how to refine that to something integral, so there could be torsion. And, you know, the answer for Roman Ramon is kind of surprising, there's some K theory. So, instead of something like ordinary integer cohomology or some twisted version of like spin C. So in this case, Witten's paper, it was guided by, in fact, looking at the anomaly of an M2 training. So it was an anomaly consideration. I guess those are the kinds of inputs. It's, it's a physical input. It's a part. It's not you know, something you calculate to figure out what is that correct quantization condition. OK. So, um, right, so I wanted to show you, uh, before I show you the kind of computation of that, I want to show you the computation of the eight invariant. So as I said, this eight invariant that was introduced by a Tita Tony Singer in the 70s. And often it's a geometric invariant that moves with a metric, so it's an analytic kind of computation. In some cases, even in the spin case, it's a topological invariant, but there it's a mod 2 invariant, usually. And then if it's a mod 2 invariant, there are other techniques you might have to calculate. It's identified with mod 2 index, something like that. Here in the pin case, as we see, it's not a mod 2 invariant, but it's still going to be a topological invariant, and so you need some other techniques to, to compute it. So here's uh, an example. So we find six generators for this group, and this is one of them. And so here's the manifold. So let's let K be a quaternion line level with a uh, minimal first punctuality class. So if I take a quaternionic line bundle, I can restrict scalars to the complex numbers. That's a rank two complex bundle. And this class is minus the second term class of that bundle. 
So that's a quaternionic line bundle. And now if I take the underlying real bundle, that's a rank 4 real bundle on S4, I take two copies and I compactify the fibers by like adding a trivial bundle and taking a projected bundle. So this is now a fiber bundle sitting over S4 with fiber with real projected manifold of dimension 8. Okay. So it's the projectivization of that bundle. So this is a 12 manifold, and that's one of the examples of our W. All right, that's one of the ones we had to come up with. And you can check these characteristic classes. This is non-zero. That implies that this W is not orientable. So this is not one of the spin cases. On the other hand, W2 equals zero. And um, well, also pi 1 is cyclic of order 2. So there are two n plus structures. And they're opposite in the same way that the ones for RP4 are. And opposite means that you get one n plus structure from another by tensoring with a double cover. And here you tensor, so to speak, tensor, with uh, the orientation double cover. So that's a canonical involution of n plus structures in these forms orbit of that. And now you can calculate W4 is zero. So we let C, this twisted integral lift, can also be chosen to be zero in this case. OK. Well, since C is zero, then uh, this, this anomaly of the C field, which is independent of the choice of the lift, but since we can choose it to be zero, we can calculate the qubit form using that. And the qubit form is obviously vanishes, so it's exponential is 1. Okay. So to check the anomaly cancellation, we have to check then that this eight invariant in the right combination, this also gives 1. And now the question becomes, how do you compute the eight invariant on a manifold like that? You certainly don't want to look at its spectrum, zeta function, regularization, the usual thing for the eight invariant and so on. But this is a topological invariant, and so um, there should be a topological formula. And we kind of discovered this formula on our own, and we're then going about thinking about how to prove it, going back to the papers of the team with Toby Singer and so on. And then it was pointed out to us by John, Jonathan Campbell that this theorem appeared really with an <coughs> analytic proof in a paper of Zhang. So this is an adaptation, but just to give you flavor for this kind of calculation. So W is a closed and let's say I have the real <coughs> rectum bundle. And let's say L is this orientation line bundle. Now, it's the H, the hyperplane bundle, over RP20, be the topological. <coughs> and finally, let's suppose that we have an, a, a map that doesn't have to be embedding, just a smooth map of our 12 manifold into projective space. And uh, it satisfies that it pulls back this topological bundle to uh, that orientation bundle. So if we have all that data, then the conclusion is we can get a formula for this eight invariant. And the way we get the formula is to see it in an equation in the KO theory um, of RP. And in fact, the reduced shape of theory. So that's some cyclic group, order of power of 2. And the formula is that this is 2 to the 11th. I think that is cyclic of order 2 to the 11th, in fact. Um, the 8 invariant on this manifold W of the Dirac operator coupled to P. So that's what we need in general. Um, that's the correct normalization. And then the generator of that cyclic group is that reduced. Anyway, what that tells you is that you can calculate this 
if uh, in KO theory. And so in this example, it's not hard to embed this bundle into RP20. You simply embed this quaternionic bundle. You add another bundle that cancels that, so it's trivializable. You can project off of S4, and that's how you make a map. All right, so that gives you a flavor of the idea. There we go. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so uh, so the anomaly cancellation, as I say, there are these two invertible field theories, and the theorem is that the tensor product is trivializable partition function is uh, trivial. But that's not the end of the story. I mean, if you have a theory with an anomaly, it's defined relative to that. You want an absolute theory. And so part of the data for your theory is, a, is not just to know that the anomaly is trivializable, but an actual trivialization. And so in this problem, we can ask, is there a unique trivialization? Right. And the answer is no. There are two trivializations. And the ratio of any two trivializations is an invertible field theory of dimension one less, so in this case, 11. So it says the group of invertible field theories in dimension 11 for this type of manifold is cyclic of order two, and the trivializations are a torsor for that. And what that means in the physics term is you get one theory from the other by putting an extra topological term in the action. And the topological term in this case is mod two index the appropriate Dirac operator. So, um, so that's something that our calculations suggested, I'm pretty sure about, but my, and uh, Meng Wo, uh, we'll write a proof of that. And, uh, yeah, so this doesn't really pin down the theory, because you'd have to decide which trivialization is. Now, to describe an element of a torsor, trivialization is not an easy thing. So how you would pin it down is, something else. It's more or less like the same problem with quantum field theory, where how do you tell what a field theory is? You might give a few correlation functions, and then that kind of sets the, the one that you have, so something like that here. All right, so here's the main computational theorem, is to calculate this Bordism group. So we don't calculate the Bordism group, we only calculate generators, and we don't do that for the whole Bordism group, but rather we're only interested in the prime two because we only have these factors of two to worry about. And so Z2 here really does not mean the cyclicals of order two. It means the integer is localized at two, where we've inverted all the other primes. So that's the correct notation. And so here we see uh, the six generators. Um, so the one that I just showed you is this one, called W0 double prime. And uh, that's the RP8 bundle over S4 that I was just talking about. There are some simpler ones that are built from lower dimensional manifolds. K is the K3 surface, that's a four manifold. The quaternionic projective uh, plane, that's an eight manifold. This buff manifold is also an eight dimensional manifold. These are all spin manifolds, in fact. And the bot manifold is one where the A hat genus is one. And um, this manifold is formed by taking well, HP2 connects on HP2 and quotienting its product with the four sphere mind in solution. If you think about the eight sphere, um, which is this, this the center, so to speak, of this connected sum, if you pour out two balls that are antipodal and you stick on these HP2s, one on each end, then you could rotate and exchange them. That preserves orientation. The antipodal map here reverses and that quotient and acts freely that quotient. That's what that thing is. And then here's another manifold you get by uh, using SO3, which is the projective uh, group of quaternion groups, that acts on HP2. It can act by left multiplication, where the quaternions defining the projective space act on the right, so it's not a trivial action. And you can use that to get that manifold. So anyway, those are the manifolds. As I say, it was hardly obvious to find them. But um, how do we know that those are the generators? Well, that's where the atom spectral sequence comes in. 
And so that's where we calculate this homotopy group approximated by this E2 term of the atom spectral sequence. So that is some homological algebra, first of all, knowing the cohomology and then sticking it into this text over the Steenrod algebra, and then getting it to the form where you can put it into the atom spectral sequence. So this is a picture of the E2 term. And then there are differentials. The differentials here are the blue arrows. And um, right, so this is meant then this is how, how one in stable homotopy theory calculates say, this kind of homotopy group, which is a Bordesian group. And um, the ones we're interested in are these ones in dimension 12. And so those six dots represent the six generators that we found. So for example, the W naught, the, the one I showed you here is probably that dot. Right, it's that one. And um, right. So some of these manifolds you can get from lower dimensional ones, as I said here, by taking products. So here's the product of the K3 surface with HP2. Here's the product. Uh, there are other ones which could be. Yeah. And here are two products with the Bopp manifold here. And so the products with the Bopp manifold are actually the ones in red. So you see the Bopp manifold is here. And now if I take these low dimensional ones, 0, 2, 4, and I take the product and see them reproduced up here. And so those are the ones that are products. And anyway, one has to analyze that. Of course, there's proof in our paper, so I'm not going to try to do that now. Um, that shows you that. And then for the calculation of the 11 dimensional ones, which is relevant to the trivializations, <coughs> E2 term has these uh, three dots, which might lead you to think it's a bigger group than cyclic of order two. But it's the, these differentials that are meant to be those two. I can leave you just with that one. That one is a product with a circle. That's what that tells you. And this red dot means it was a product with the Bopp manifold of the Klein bottle. So the non-trivial manifold there is, in fact, the circle cross Klein bottle cross Bopp manifold. So that's a very easier one to get hold of. The Bopp manifold is, is what's sometimes called like a fourth K3 squared. It's called what? It's a, it, in, in spin cobordism? Sure. Yeah. It's in four times. Four times it is K3 squared? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think I'll stop it. And very naive question? Yeah. So, um, the thing which is uh, canceling the, the anomaly just involving the C field is the gravitino. Is it uh, is it uniquely the gravitino that can cancel it? Can you sort of understand that you cannot have a consistent bosonic theory with just gravity in the C field in uh, eleven dimensions? If you want it to be consistent on an on oriented manifold, is that a true statement? That seems pretty amazing that you can force supersymmetry in this way. What is saying you can two copies of the C field? Huh? Just had two copies of the C field and cancel them. Well, probably not because you can't have two copies. I mean, it's, it, a it, it, it's just a. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a. It's a. It's a, it's a it's, um, okay. No, but 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 let's literally take this theory with just one, uh, with just this bosonic content, just uh, gravity plus a plus a C field. Um, like, it 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 has to be a gravitino, right? I mean, uh, a, a, a fermion. Uh, some well, there's fermion a subtle point that to define that invariant. Um, I mean, we used pin plus in a kind of minor way, the fact that we were on pin plus manifolds. And you might wonder where did that structure come from if you didn't have a spin or a gravitational field to, to, to want the pin plus structure. No, I, might, I'm, I'm asking about right. the distinction between between uh, between uh, gravitino and Carl Fermion. Uh, uh, gravitino and a Carl Fermion. Could Carl Fermions cancel the anomaly or only the gravitino? That's, that, that's what I'm asking. What does Carl Fermion mean on what do you mean by whatever you mean by the Myron? What, whatever you mean by the Myron of Fermi? Whatever you're doing for the Gravitino, just uh, remove one vector index from it <laughs> and do uh, that. Okay, now I, see. Yeah. I think yeah. the answer is no. Uh -huh. I think that uh, probably would follow. But I, I have to think about it. You see, of these six generators, I think what's true is that there's only one of them. <laughs> where the 
I mean, the product is one, right? But you could ask, when is when are they both minus one? And I think if I remember, there's only one of them on which they're both minus one. So that's the only one in a sense you have to cancel. And um, I'd have to look a little bit. But I think that's an answer to the question in this calculation. Um, the fact that there are these two different trivializations of the anomaly theory, right? Um, you have some comment in your paper where you say on, on, a, on a, a, a spin manifold, I believe, there's a canonical choice of trivialization, or, or maybe a string manifold. Yes. And and so, but more generally, you could say this this looks like there's two different versions of M theory, right? That means that there's a topological term you could add to the action, or you could not add to the action of M theory. But we don't believe that there are two different versions of M theory. Do you have any thoughts on on how to resolve that? Oh. No. Okay. Um. Not really. I mean, it may be that, I mean, the only thought is what you said, that maybe by restricting the spin manifold, you can get it down. Right, but, but we, oh, oh you can pin well, it down and then, well, well I think they, they become, become the same. Then they become the same, yeah. So that probably doesn't pin it down. Yeah. Yeah. Probably that one of the terms, there's more data that needs to speci be specified. There's like another term. field in M theory, which, which specifies well, the, it's, where it's like, you know, a spin structure is not just something that one W T something. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But in a sense, yeah, I mean, you see, if you're trivializing that field theory, which is the tensor product of those, that also, that trivialization has to satisfy all the local of the yeah. So in a sense, that is a kind of field, if you like. Right. It has to be local. Yeah. So this is following up, but if we have this term in M theory, then they should imply something on my Right. If you have this extra term, yeah. yeah. See, so I think if it's you a take the, the heterotic setup, then it should tell you that something else leaks on the wall. I think it's a little bit hard, the language of do we have the term or not, because we're talking about something in this torsor of trivializations. So depending on how you define the trivialization, you'd go to the other one by putting in the term. But you might have defined the trivialization differently, so you didn't have to put in the term. So it's not that you can look at the thing and say, I have this term, I don't have. Once you introduce boundary, you always trivialize such torsions. Once what? Once you introduce boundary, you always trivialize such torsions. Well, yes, sounds. Actually, we could have discussed in the lunch. Well, I think yeah. take the best from Nima. 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 What, 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 uh, is there any cousin of this anomaly in lower dimensions? Like, like let's say I, I compactify on some circles, but then consider something un unoriented and think which is left. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one reason I ask is we could get rid of the gravitino. For, uh, for example, I mean, uh, I could I could do some sort of short schwartz compactification, give anti periodic boundary conditions on the gravitino, and then I don't have a gravitino on the low energy theory anymore. So you would think that, uh, that maybe the anomaly... I don't remember. I mean, again, if I would yeah. remember which one had the non-trivial anomaly, I think there was one of the product manifolds, well, in a sense, would tell you that. I see. If you're trying to get rid of the gravitino, if you're trying to get rid of the gravitino, if you do short shorts compactification, that's on S1 with anti-periodic boundary conditions, mm -hmm. right? And, and that already is a boundary because we're So taking product with that, we'll, we'll, we'll kill any of this. I think the product with S1 is product with the supersymmetric S1, um, right? The, the S1, the product is the is the well, certainly the non is the non-bounding non structure. No, no, but, but I, I don't have to make the S1 an, an integral. I could make it a circle with just anti-periodic boundary conditions. I'm saying, saying that that's all. I'm saying that that's a boundary in Fortism, and so okay, uh, okay. Yeah. That, 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 that's 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 the answer to my question. Yeah. I, so that that, that thing, uh, I, okay, good. Yeah, that seemed too 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 dumb. Okay, great. Any more quick questions? Come on, yeah, please. Could, can you say more about extending down? Because there, I expect more of the MC structure to show up, right? Like as opposed to just existence, if you try to find the open space of the dimensional spatial slice in three. And yeah. By some trick that I think I didn't quite follow, you said all of that lower down data is going to be completely fixed just by checking the partition function of the 12 dimensional and vertical top function. Well, that was just a general comment about vertical field theories. So, you know, when we have a field theory, we have to make a target for the field theory where, where do these partition functions, correlation functions live. So at the top, in this 11 dimensional theory, you know, we get complex numbers. Rotate it. Then at the next level, we get vector spaces. But what you get after that, right. you know, it's a little bit up for grabs. On the other hand, if you have an invertible theory, then there is a 
canonical target all the way down that won't work for non-invertible things, it only has invertible things in it. And with that target, it's characterized by the property that the partition function determines the theta that characterizes that target. And once you choose that target based on that characterization, very beautiful things happen, like you see the boson fermion dichotomy, and you see things one dimension lower with line operator. So you see some structure that we recognize. So I'm using, in a sense, that implicitly, that we're using that target. Now you might think that... Is that justified? What? Yeah, do you know that's justified? Well, no, because how would I justify it? I mean, we would have to know the 11-dimensional theory was you know, fully extended in some other target, and we'd have to know the invertible part of that target is what we're talking about. But I don't know what that target is, so I'm short of that. And also, in any case, M theory is not a quantum field theory, right? M theory is quantum gravity. Well, there's that, too. Yeah. But we're treating it here as a quantum field theory. Sure, but, but if you want to start talking about things like the, M, the Hilbert space of M theory or something. But that's a general remark about that kind of question. Any more questions or comments? So if now we will meet at the drill to the small seminar room. There's a, a bunch people can discuss. And let's say stand again. <laughs> Fantastic talk, it's always great. Uh, 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 u